Are you brave enough to tackle and take on and try and defeat the Queen of Chaos, who grows ever stronger sitting behind the Gates of Death? <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Friday Fantasy Show from the Bottled Imp, exploring the realms of fantasy. My name is Ken Boyter and today we are taking a look at The Gates of Death by Charlie Higson. And it's a very, very shiny cover, so I'm going to hold it very carefully just in case there's glare everywhere. But there isn't. So, let's crack on. Hey, have I been drinking? Who knows? No, it's The Gates of Death. This is published by Scholastic and it was published in, I believe it was 2018. And this is the latest original new story in the fighting fantasy series. Now that was first published way back in uh, 1982 by Puffin and it was created by Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson of Games Workshop fame. Yes, and they wrote all well, the whole series, of, I, there must have been 40 odd books, maybe 50 odd books. And over the years they've been a few reprints, but this is one of the latest ones. Now, when they relaunched it a couple of years ago with Scholastic publishing it, they commissioned new artists, they also um, commissioned Ian Livingston to write a new novel, a new game book. These are game books, yeah. And it's The Port of Peril. And they also then announced that Charlie Higson of the Fast Show fame and also Young Bond and he is a, he's written many adult sort of dystopian novels as well. So he's got a pedigree in writing. They announced that he was going to write one and this is the result. So is it any good? Let's find out. <laughs> the Gates of Death that just was going on. Well, it is a game book. I don't think I necessarily made that too clear right at the beginning of, of the intro there. But it is a game book. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that. A game book is basically a branching narrative book with combat or some sort of other bells and whistles. Branching stories have been around for at least 100 years, as far as I know, as far as I can remember. There's a half fact for you. And branching stories are basically where you choose how the story unfolds. So it could be a simple choice as in, there's two doorways in front of you. Do you pick the left one or do you pick the right one? Hopefully there's a few more clues to give you that. an informed decision. Sometimes they're not, it's just which it is, it's random. You go through the left one, you go through the right one. And so throughout the story, then, then if it's, you pick the left, it will say, right, so turn to um, page or entry 267 and you turn to that page and then you follow the story like that. And that's how the story uh, unfolds. Now obviously if you only play the game book once you only know some of the story but inevitably well in these uh, fighting fantasy books you can die and you probably will die because there are many ways to die in these books and so what you do is you will then start again and obviously you think oh yeah okay so I took the left door and I died eventually you know, I'll take the right door this time. So it is I guess it's the pre-runner or 82, so computer games were just coming out, just, you know, you had the ZX Spectrum, you had the Commodore 64, I don't know the exact dates of those machines, but I remember having ZX Spectrum, and there were adventure games like that, where you would choose, it was text-based, and you would just shoot with the odd bit of pictures, oh, those were the days, oh yes, 48K, eh? Texts are bigger than that nowadays. Anyway, so you'd have a whole adventure and you would go through like that and it was very enjoyable. I guess the, the most extreme version of that where we are now in this sort of gameplay is something like Skyrim, where you've got choices, you make the decisions. That It doesn't necessarily restrict you. But of course, these are books and you've only got, you know, they, so many pages you can f fit in. So you have to restrict the choices. But those are the, I would say those are the early germs of where we are now with Skyrim. But anyway, the setup, like all these books, there is a bit of housekeeping. At the beginning, you have, you've got an adventure sheet that has various boxes on it. It's skill, stamina, luck, equipment, gold, potions, weapons provisions, plus there's the monster encounter chart that records when you meet a monster and you have to fight the monster and each monster has a skill and stamina. So what you do is right before you start playing the game you have to determine your skill, stamina and luck and what you do is with skill you roll 1d6 dice and you then add 6 to that number. 
and then you write it in a little box and that is your starting uh, skill score. You do the same for stamina but you roll 2d6 instead but, and you add 12 to that number and then for luck it's back to one die and you add 6 to that number. How the combat works though, eventually as you go through the story, you will run into some monsters or some nasty humans that, you know, might want to pick a fight with you. So the combat is relatively simple. You roll 2d6 and you add this number to the monster's skill score, because they'll, they'll have a skill score. And then you roll 2d6 for yourself and you add that number to your current skill score. Now your skill score, luck and stamina, bless you, can go down. It's Julian just sneezing. Oh hey, he's getting attacked by a sneeze monster. <laughs> the, um, your luck, skill, stamina can actually decrease and can go up throughout the, the course of the game. So you have to take your current skill score and then you'll be adding your two dice for combat, that score to that. So whoever's score is higher, has wounded the other person or monster. So if, if the monster's skill score or attack score is higher, you minus two off your stamina and vice versa. If it's a draw, well then you've both missed, useless, and then you just start the combat again. And the combat ends when either you die or the monster dies. I did say you could die pretty quickly. Um, so if your stamina is reduced to zero, you, you you're dead and likewise if the monster has got their stamina to zero they're dead now there are various times that you'll be asked to test your luck so it might be that um you know you're walking down a corridor and you've not checked for traps not that you can just say i want to check for traps but there could be an option where it says check for traps and you ignore that and you carry on going or it could just randomly happen where you know you just hear a whooshing sound and you see an arrow coming towards you you would test your luck and if you win and you you know have luck it will say you dodge out the way as you quickly as you, the arrow you know swoops past you if you fail it, it will say yeah you get hit in the head you are dead or it might not be as so severe as that but it might say you get wounded and you lose three stamina points and the way you do that is you roll two d6 dice and if the number rolled is equal or less than your current luck score you have been lucky if it's not, then you're unlucky. And as I say, there are um, descriptions of if you've been lucky or if you've not been lucky. So you, once you've you know, read all the rules, you kind of know what's going on, you can crack on to the story. So what's the story all about? Well, a terrible plague has devastated the land of, and I can never pronounce it, as you know, regular viewers will know, <laughs> Alanancia, A-L-L-A-N-S-I-A. Now, I'm, I'm going to probably be going to the Fighting Fest uh, festival event that happens in London. Um, I went to the last one, it was very enjoyable. I might actually ask Ian Livingstone how you pronounce it. It's a bit of a, you know, rubbish question, isn't it? Hi, how's it I've spoken to him before, he's a lovely guy. He'll probably laugh and then tell me that I've been pronouncing it wrong all this time. Anyway, there's a sickness that's been devastating the land and it's striking people down with a sickness that turns them into hideous demonic monsters. Yes, nobody wants that. So you've got to travel to the invisible city with a smoke oil antidote that has the power to cure the sickness. Woohoo! So just like regular novels, there are various themes. And so, you know, Charlie Hickson is a good writer. The writing quality is really good in this. There is the theme of them and us, or good and evil. Now, the them are the infected, the us are the uninfected. So already you've got that you know, conflict that's going to happen. And like most fantasy, um, certainly high fantasy, the story does revolve around good versus evil. I mean, that's a clear storyline, especially in this sort of combat type game books. You kind of want a simple notion that the reader can just grab onto. So there is the notion obviously that the heroes are virtuous and on the side of justice fighting against evil, which is the enemy. Because we don't want the Queen of Chaos to infect everybody and, and then we're all under her control. So you, the reader, are on the good side. So, you know, as I say, Hickson has picked a solid, familiar theme as the main drive, you know, and, and you know, you, you want to cure people. That's a very lofty motive as a character. There's trust. You are actually, you know, a character in this. You are a humble acolyte um, of the ancient guardians of the crucible. 
Not not that crucible, not up in Sheffield, not the snooker. Although that would be quite a good story, wouldn't it? And a, <laughs> an adventure game book, you know, set. Try, anyway, no, <laughs> maybe that'll come out in a couple of years' time. You are tasked to serve Brother Tobin, who has been charged with taking the smoke oil to the invisible city. So you're like his assistant, you're learning the trade of healing, and, and presumably you're like a monk type character. And along the way, you do meet various characters, and as such, you are tested in trust. When somebody says something to you, do you trust them? Can you trust anyone? Should you trust anyone? What makes you trust someone? Is it their appearance? Is it the way they talk? Is it their, is, or is it just instinct? I just get a funny feeling about that person, or I get a good feeling about that person. What about the creatures? Just because someone looks different to you, or acts different, is that a, is, should you be suspicious? Nah, maybe not, maybe you should trust them. So you've got to work out who to trust and who not to trust, you know, it, it, and, and that is part of the fun of these books because there's, there's always twists. Whenever you meet somebody, there's nine times out of ten there'll be a twist to it. So there's that theme of trust. There's also strength of teamwork. Now, I know that these are billed as solo adventure games, and but along the way, in, especially in this book, there is many people that you, you meet and creatures that you meet that you do need the help of. You might need the information of them, you might need their protection. And in fact, at one point, which is, I hadn't come across this, I've not read too many fighting fancy books, but they, um, you get a little buddy, you get somebody that helps you along the way. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, quite a nice twist. Um, although saying that, I think the Port of Peril, you also, yeah, no, you do get a companion as well. So maybe it's not as original as I thought it was. But I just thought, oh, that's quite cool. And of course, you're, you're assisting Brother Tobin. Maybe that's the person I mean, Brother Tobin. And, and, and that's quite nice. You start off with someone, with a companion. And in order, if you're going to win this book, you know, you're going to win and actually cure everybody of this um, hideous infection, then you do need to have teamwork. But then that's what I'm saying. It tags in with that trust. You need teamwork, but you don't know who to trust and that's part of the fun. There is that risk that your trust will just turn to dust and you think, ah, I shouldn't have trusted them. So overall, yes, it is very, very enjoyable. Now, the way I reviewed this one or played this one, read this one was, um, we do an imp chat live on Facebook, on our Facebook account, which is in the group, so the fellowship. So if you go onto Facebook and you search for the Bottled Imp Fellowship, then click the join and, we'll, and button and we'll add you in and every two weeks I've been doing this and reading them out and people have been um, choosing them so I'll be giving the, the viewers you know they type in comments so I say if you want this to happen type 325 if you want this to happen type you know whatever and they vote and then obviously the, the, the one that gets the more votes we go and do that so it's really really cool playing it with a lot of, with a lot of people as well because they've been really enjoying it so it's nice not just to kind of get my opinion about this it's nice to get other opinions and what we all enjoyed about this is a real heavy heavy theme not theme there's just humor that runs through the book as well and obviously charlie hickson it, it was known for for his humor in the fast show and he's a very solid writer as well so you've got that combination and it really is it's nice so yes he takes things seriously, and he, you know, and he's a big fan apparently of, the, of these books. But yet he kind of pokes fun at it because there's, even in the first paragraph, you, you let, basically you fall over. I think that's what happens. You fall over, and you lose five stamina points just for no reason. So that's kind of a bit of a poking fun at the original books, where random things could happen, and you think, hey, oh, that's not fair. So I like that. And there's lots of other things. Uh, there's a bum-faced monster. Yep. Yeah, you have to fight a bum-faced monster. There is a grown-up kind of Pinocchio-type character who is over a thousand years old. That, that's quite a humorous scene there. So there's a lot of humor that runs through there. The story, as I keep saying, the writing is really, really good in this. It's, it moves along, the pacing is just right. The entries aren't too long. Sometimes there are quite a long entries. And it's weird, because when you're reading it out to someone else, I was very conscious that, I, that, that people playing the game wanted to make the decisions but they really enjoyed the, the, the longer sections because you could put more detail into it. And I think that's the key, just like any normal book, normal novel, good characterization, good story, you know, that's kind of the base, that's the spine of what it should be. And, and it's the same with these game books. You know, don't get caught out by going, oh, well, yeah, they'll be fighting monsters, they'll be doing this. No, 
characters, story. you've got to invest emotionally, you want to care that you actually solve this and, and help these people out. And you do, it, it's delightful in that way. And you know, there are tragic moments in there that you go, oh, I didn't want that to happen. There are lovely, weird objects that you find and little, little kooky things that you find that you may or may not need, like a blue frog. We, we found a little blue, I think it was a metal blue frog, I think, a little statue of a blue frog. We didn't use that. We had no, no idea. I mean, there was never a choice to use that. We had it anyway. It was a nice little ornament. So, you know, we took it back to, to our little tavern. Maybe sold it. Sold it on eBay. Yeah? Yeah. Anyway, so I do like... Oh, also, it's the weapons list at the back. Now, I don't know when they introduced this in Fighting Fantasy, but there's a weapons list. In the early ones, you basically just, you know, you'd have a weapon. And it didn't do anything other than just knock, you know, if you wounded somebody, you get two points knocked off them. But there's a list of weapons that do other things as well. So they're slightly, you know, they're not necessarily magical weapons, but they will react slightly differently. So they might add three, you know, it might damage three wound points. Or they might, you know, I don't know, if you roll a double, it, something might happen. So I don't know if that's the actual thing, but there are other things that go on. So that adds a little bit more variety. Um, but the, the only downside, the only reservation that I have about this book is the going round in circles. There does seem to be quite a narrow path that you have to find. There's not really many ways to, to win, if you like. I think there's possibly only one way, I'm not sure. But, um, and if you don't find that, you just go round and round in circles. Now, if you're reading it on your own, that's maybe okay, but you probably still get a bit frustrated. I certainly get frustrated. But then, obviously, if we're playing it as a game, you know, with other people, we got a bit frustrated because it was like, okay, so we did, you know, we did an hour session here, and we basically just went back and backtrack and did what we did the last session. So I guess you know that that would be my only reservation. So. I'm, I'm now writing my own one. I've been very influenced by these and other you know, quest books. We have done reviews of other quest books. And one of the things I'm going to do is not have it where you can actually go round and round in circles and try to eliminate that frustration. But that is pretty much the only thing that's the downside. I do like the combat system. We, you know, everybody likes rolling dice, surely, chucking dice around. It's fun. It's simple. You don't have to get bogged down with stats or anything like that. The little adventure sheet is really cool. The one thing I will say, again, well, the downside as well, the illustrations. They're good, they're fine, you know, but they're not, they don't evoke emotions in me. I much prefer the old, you know, line drawing illustrations. I, I just felt there's more emotion, there's more tension in them, and I just prefer them. But that's, you know, that's my personal preference. I think they wanted to do different style because, you know, these are primarily, these are kids' books, you know, and Scholastic, as a publisher, has to think, you know, what's, what's our audience, and they're gonna primarily be kids. But they've got a big following, so you might get older people enjoying them as well. But I think they wanted to modernise the, the illustrations. So fair enough, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a call they made. I'm personally not a massive fan of it. Um, bless you again. He's really getting attacked, isn't he? One more. One more, here we go. No, it's gone. It's gone, it's gone. He managed to fight it off with magical powers. Or maybe just take some, you know, uh, allergy tablets or something. He doesn't do that. No, anyway, we're rambling now. No, um, yeah, the combat system was, was fun, but the illustrations, yeah, so I do miss those old illustrations. So I'm, as I say, I'm developing my own, and it's interesting, you know, the mistakes that you can make when writing these, and also I didn't want the, co I'm going to develop a different combat system, but I don't want it to be over, overly complicated, but it will involve dice. I'm also thinking of putting other things in, maybe like, I don't know, off the top of the head, you might have like a sanity meter or you might have other things that you can, you know, just mix it up a bit. And there are other game books out there. Um, and, and I'm getting more and more involved in these game books, you know, and I'm curious to see how other people have done them. Now, we have done a few other reviews of those, so check those out. But anyway, yes, yeah, so The Gates of Death, you will enjoy it, I guess. Yeah, no, you will. I can't. Anyway, yeah, it's a good book. What more do you want me to say? Hey! <laughs> the Gates of Death! Yes! I do recommend it. It's a lot of fun. So well done for everybody that's made this book. And, and, and well done for Scholastic for taking them up again and actually trying to you know, inject a new life into them. So I believe there's... I, I don't know how many they've done now. There's, they haven't published all of them. They've probably done about 15 of them now, or 12 or 13. I hope that they keep going with these because these are good. This is what got me into fantasy. This and a few other things, Lord of the Rings, 
I remember reading, and it actually got me into reading books. I remember reading this and, and it's like, wow, this is exciting. This is a topic I love, fantasy and monsters and creatures and, you know, a faraway place and all of that and imagination. And, and, and it really encouraged me to read. So if you can find a series of books or a book that does that and inspires kids to read, that can't be a bad thing, can it? As I said before, we've reviewed a few more of these as well. We've reviewed the very first uh, uh, book, which was made into an audio, which is the Warlock of Firetop Mountain audio radio play, basically. So check that out as well. And there is, hopefully, I'm going to be going to the Fighting Fest. Fighting, f what's it called? Fighting, I can't remember. Anyway, it's organised by Jonathan Green. It's Fighting Fest 3. So check that out on the social media. If you type that in, Google that. You should be able to come along as well. It's taking place in London. Anyway, remember to keep it unreal, especially if you're infected. Mm.